I'm a feminist, but yesterday uh, I had to call a cab on an app and some friends and I were all getting in the cab and I predictably kept everyone waiting, ADHD. And I ran downstairs and I jumped into the cab and said to the driver, I'm so sorry for keeping you waiting, sir. The driver was a woman. (laughs) Wow. Wow. That was not funny to this audience at all. Wow. They were just <laughs> horrified by me and the situation. See, sometimes with I'm a feminist Barts, it's not far enough and the audience go, well, that's not really unfeminist. And sometimes it's clearly too unfeminist and they go, well, I'm just judging you. The sweet spot is I've done that too. Clearly not one person in this room, this sizable audience goes, yeah, I relate to that. Every single one of you checks the gender of your cab driver before you get into the cab and make sure that you don't use it or does, doesn't know the gender, doesn't assume the gender, doesn't use a gender term. Says driver. Hello. Hello, driver. That's better, yeah. Hey, driver. I'm going to try it again, but I'm going to try and make it funnier for the record because this is, we're gonna, this, this is going to go up. <laughs> and many of you will know that this is the cold open now. So what you'll hear when you listen for the first time, this is the first thing you'll hear because this is, we edit this in as a cold open. Do you want me to do um, a fake laugh? I mean, I'm just going to try and make it... I'm going to try and make it genuinely funny, but if you could also fake laugh, that'd be helpful. I'm going to throw it so it sounds like I'm in the audience. Okay. I'm a feminist, but the other day I got into a cab and said, thank you for waiting, sir. And the driver said, I'm not a sir, I'm a woman. (laughs) Now, that laugh just sounds sarcastic now. That's too far. What we're looking for is a medium-sized chuckle. I think it needs a kappa, doesn't it? It needs me to have a reaction to that. Because otherwise it's just like, you've got something wrong. So I think the kappa needs to be something like, um, and I said, oh, okay, I've got it. I actually have got it. I actually have got it because I, I, this is really what happened now. I'm going to tell you the whole story. Okay. All right. Again, we're looking for a medium-sized chuckle. Think about when you listen to the podcast and you get the opening line. You go, oh, that's really funny. Right, okay. We don't start with our best one. We just start with a strong one. All right, ready? (laughs) I'm a feminist, but the other day I got in a cab and said, I'm so sorry, sir, for keeping you waiting. And the driver said, I'm a woman. And I said, oh, I'm a feminist, but... That was, that was so fun because I've done this with you for years and I don't remember it ever like re recording. <laughs> three times. No, it never normally happens, but I'm determined so to get funny. this right. Okay, let's, let's workshop this. <laughs> let's workshop this. I think everyone's going to be happy when they hear that. They're, you're going to hear that and you're going to go, we oh. know that was the third iteration, but the audience at home won't know. This is why you come live to oh, see so how the sausage funny. is made. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Have you got one? Yeah. Um, I'm a feminist, but I went to go watch the new Wakanda Forever film, and it was, like, really sick. It was great. But I felt like they were queer baiting a little bit, and I know that you should never be like, uh, be gay! Um, (laughs) But (laughs) I just feel like Letitia Wright should be gay! (laughs) And um, there was a new character, Riri Williams, and there was like vibes between them. They should be gay together. And uh, <laughs> I just don't know. That's a very feminist stance, but it is um, how I feel. I, I think it's a reasonable. It's a reasonable request that people be gay when you want them to. Kima, um, uh, it, it feels uh, right. I'm a feminist, uh, but uh, one of my very close friends today, who is a black woman, said to me uh, she was taken out by an older white man who just said, I want to give you some advice and mentor you because I think you're very talented. And she said it was an amazing feeling because he's a sort of icon of his industry. And I went, you know what? Sometimes all we want is for some old man who looks like God (laughs) to tell us you're chosen. (laughs) It's true, though. It's true, though. I... I like have some also Zeus looking motherfucker. Yeah. I have recently also had some validation from an older white man and I it felt like 
fucking amazing. It feels like God slash Zeus going, you are talented. You're not wrong. Stay in the game. It's the power structure going, hey, kid. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> hey, kid, stick with me, kid. I'll make you a star. It's, and you go, you look like Jehovah. Sure. It's the system. And they've been like, you're never going to like be me, but. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's <laughs> like being great. touched by the Holy Spirit. It's probably that weird thing of like, if you had a lovely stranger that was like, oh, I think that the work that you produce is so awesome. Like, and it's like, oh, thank you so much. But then like, if like every bad man in your family <laughs> stood in a line and was like, I think the work you do is so awesome. It would probably mean more for some weird reason. And I think that's on Freud. <laughs> Well, Freud looks like God, so yes. A hundred percent that. I was going to ask if he was dead, but it felt like a bad question. He's very dead. Yeah, okay. He's been dead for <laughs> I felt that, years. like, instinctually. Yeah, I think he's, like, 1800s. Yeah, cool, You're cool, fine. cool, 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 cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, in fact, <laughs> in fact uh, is there... Uh, what was your name, sir? David. David, great. David, um, would you be our human Google tonight? Where if we, ha- if we need something fact-checked, you just fact-check it for us. The reason um, I pick uh, a white, straight, cisgender man to do this is because I find they're the only ones who don't mind interrupting to tell us the answer. <laughs> I've tried it with women. It doesn't work. Because you have to come back to them and two hours later you go, um, did you find it? They go, yes, but I didn't like to interrupt. And a man will just power through. Uh, so if you can't get any um, signal down here, David, which is sometimes the case, don't worry. Just confidently answer... With your first thought, and we will believe you, because that's how we use Google anyway. 1939. What year was yesterday. What year was he born? Uh, 1856. Yeah, 1856. Right. And I think of him as sort of late Victorian, early 20th century. I, I don't think of him often. <laughs> uh, I'm a feminist, but... I'm sorry. Like, you know how there's all this propaganda that, like, Girls don't know what they want to eat and stuff. Um, I've been doing some research and stuff, and like, whenever I'm trying to find something to eat, it takes me a really long time. And I've been hanging out with my friends, Debs included. These people, you know, oftentimes girls much better, at faster at picking out food than me. And I've come to the conclusion that it's me. Uh, I'm the reason that there's the propaganda and I just want to say (laughs) I'm so sorry to the rest of you that know what you want to eat and can pick a meal on time. That was more of a confession, I think. Do you think you personally have created a stereotype about women? I think so. I've been... Because I'm a bad driver. Oh, no! (laughs) I'm the one. Oh, no! I can't reverse park. I just... I get in a flap. And that's why you assume that your driver wouldn't be a woman because you thought... Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This feels so, so cool, isn't it? Yeah. And it feels bad because you're like, I know I'm living up to a stereotype, but what can you do? Like, I just keep saying I'm an intuitive eater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just um, not very in touch with my intuition. I, I, okay, what Tom says I do is, and he might be right, is I order off a menu in a restaurant, cafe, and then I, every single time, say to the waiter, actually, actually, can I have the cauliflower instead? And I change the order every time. I'm very definitive at first. I'm like... But then there's a go-back moment. Yes. I'll have I the got it. It'll be this. Think about it. Every yeah. time. I, it's, I just have to do a second draft. I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but the main obsession that I've had this week, in amongst... Uh, one of the most politically fractious weeks we've had in a politically fractious year um, has been trying to get a heated clothes era, um, which it's, it's become an obsession because you can't get them because of the energy crisis. Everyone's brought them up. So do people know about this? You know what? You know a clothes era where you just drape. It's it's. You know if you're listening globally, if you're listening in Australia, this sounds hilarious to you. But we have to dry our clothes indoors over like a little metal rack thing and we drape our knickers on the radiators um you know it's 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 oh my god americans are listening and they're like "Mm, what in the dickens yes (laughs) would you guys just eat up all the power on those big tumble dryers it's true oh we put our kids in them don't even dry them off after the bath right (laughs) and so 
we tend more to just use the radiators and drips because that, anyway, our dryers are terrible. But um, I found out recently that you can get ones you can plug in. They're very, very low energy, very low yeah. waste to the environment, very low cost, and also they heat the room. So it's good for the environment and it's great for the fuel crisis. Every, every single person, human being, dog, cat, rat in London has bought one ahead of me. You can't get them. I'm out there desperately obsessing. I know I've got so many feminist shows coming up, which we're pl- trying to plan something on Iran, which is so important. We're trying to plan something on the NHS, which is so important. We're trying to plan, constantly trying to plan all these shows and write, finish my book. But I just keep getting distracted every five minutes. I'm like, maybe there's one online now. <laughs> Why are you smiling? Have you got one? Yeah. Fucking hell. <laughs> but guess what? What? I haven't opened it. No! <laughs> It's wasted on you, don't deserve it. No, friend. This is a beautiful moment. I don't want it. (gasps) Can I buy it from you? Yeah. Go! (laughs) Oh, I think we just, I think we just gum treed. We did. I think we did. I, I, I got it because I was freaking out because uh, my last apartment had a dryer, but the, I was like, oh, can I go back? Can I go back? What, does um, it have a cover out of interest? Yes, it does have a cover. It's... <laughs> One with the cover so oh. much. Oh, <gasps> so this amazing. is the most middle class moment. I've, I'm going to PayPal you tonight for this that. This is so thing. exciting. I'll come and pick it up. I'm just so. It's I taking up even. space in my house. <gasps> I think I've had a small orgasm. Now. Yeah, I feel uh, it. <laughs> Live from King's Place in London. The Spontaneity Shop presents the Guilty Feminist with me, Nicole Francis White. Yes, guys, keep up. up. We're back. Look, unexplained public laughter disrupts the patriarchy t-shirt right in the front row. Boom. Boom. Anyone else wearing merch? Ours or anyone else's? Anyone wearing feminist shirts? Give us a cheer. Oh, you're just... Oh, you're doing... They're stretching their t-shirts. But you can't hear that on a podcast. Um, If you're wearing a feminist t-shirt or other paraphernalia, give us a cheer. There you are. Uh, What does yours say? On Wednesdays, we smash the patriarchy. And this one says, drink coffee, read books, dismantle the patriarchy. In that order. <laughs> and, I, and have you drunk coffee and have you read books? Yeah. Well, then it's time. <laughs> Immediately after the show, the revolution will begin. I will see you down at the House of Commons. And whatever you choose to do, I didn't tell you to do, but I will back you. Um, <laughs> obviously, that is a joke. Um, it's not really, though. It's not really. I will. Um, so thank you so much for coming out. I give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. Woo! Give us a cheer if you don't know what you're at. <laughs> right. Now notice that, how that cheer, that lonely cheer, is less empowered, <laughs> less certain, less feminist, if you will. Uh, don't worry. If you don't know what you're at, this is a podcast, which is um, radio that nobody stops you making. Um, that is why so many women do it, uh, because the normal channels are closed down to us. Uh, so we've started making our own art. This is basically like a radio show, but made of rubber bands and glue. Um, any cisgendered straight men in the audience? Just give us a cheer. See how that cheer is too confident. <laughs> You're at a feminist show. There's hardly any of you, but still it's like, Woo, I'm here. Uh, I'm up for it. I just always think if I went to a men's rights activist conference... <laughs> Which I might at some point, just because I want to know what they're saying. I would not sit up the front. And I would not make direct eye contact. And also, if they said, are there any women in? I'd be like, no. I just... And if they said, are you in fact a woman? I'd be like, yeah. And then if they said, and do you believe in more rights for men? I'd be like, yeah. I love more rights. Yum, yum, more rights. I don't, men haven't got enough rights. I, I'm here to support that. I've had the red pill or the blue pill or what, I don't know what pills I'm meant to have had, but I've had them all. 
Um, I would not confidently go, woohoo, but that's because of social conditioning. Sir, I am not wanting to dampen your confidence. I'm just wanting to drain a bit from you, like a vampire, and then redistribute it around the room. Um, like a socialist vampire <laughs> who sucks your not blood confidence and then sticks it into other people. Has anyone ever heard of a vampire that's like a Robin Hood meets Dracula? I think that's good. I think that's good. No, no one's buying it. Okay. Um, well, you're not commissioning. Unless you are commissioning, in which case, hi. Robin Blood. Well done. Thank you very much. That's right, my friend. Robin Blood. You and me now. You and me. We're going to get that on Netflix. They'll all be sorry. They'll be sorry. They won't be sorry. They'll be watching it. They'll be up all night binging it, going, we were there when Robin Blood was invented. The first spark. So exciting. Um, so I've been asking audiences, and you may have heard this on the podcast, what have you done since I've seen you last that's feminist? And the first time I asked that, um, I said, has anyone done anything feminist? Uh, someone put a hand up and went, yes, I actually have uh, raised uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds to take the Met Police to court because they illegally said that we couldn't have a vigil and uh, we have proven our point and now that has become a precedent in law because the Met Police lost, and, I, and everyone went, yay! And then I said, has anyone else done anything feminist? And everyone went, no, God, no, no, nothing. No, fuck no. They all just said, no, I don't, don't, don't call myself a feminist, really. I don't know why I get out of bed. I've done nothing with my life. I'm just a shell of a human. Um, can't even call myself a person, not just a feminist. So what I've said since then is, could we have a lower bar to begin? Um, what I'm looking for is an act of feminism that would intimidate nobody. I'm looking for something to make everyone else in this audience go, well, I can do better than that. Something to encourage people. Yes? I went on a trip. Yes, went on a trip. I left behind my kids. You left your kids at home? With, their, with my husband. That's good to know. Just, uh, not, not just in a, in a basement. Because <laughs> this might be getting into anti-feminism now. This. And I didn't leave any instructions. <gasps> this is... That is wonderful. So you just left your husband with your children... Shared children. There were also his children up. Your was plural. You couldn't hear that, but it was. With your joint collective children, and you just walked out the door. You didn't leave any instructions as to where anything was, what time anything should happen, who needs to be picked up for karate, and why they hate it anyway. You just said, work it the fuck out. When you came back, was he on his knees going, please never leave again. You're amazing. I really appreciate what you do now. She's on the trip. Now, this is the trip. The trip is the trip. How long have you been away? Four years. <laughs> it's been three days. It's been three days. I'm going back on Friday. Oh, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> I, I my phone off. Oh, you, so you don't even know how it's going? You've just turned your phone off. Oh, the jeopardy in the room now. There are mothers all over this room going, oh, yes. Oh, this feels good. This was just hearing about this. I'll never have the courage. <gasps> but this feels good hearing about it. Has anyone else ever done anything like that? Just give us a cheer. Yes? Yes? No, you're just wait, raising your hand for another feminist point. Okay. Has anyone ever done... What's your name? Katie. Has anyone ever done what Katie's done? You have. How did it go? It was fine. We wanted you to say it was an absolute disaster. I'll never do it again. <laughs> To be honest, that, that, would, that would have been more amusing. But listen, what's more reassuring for Katie is that it's going to be fine. They'll all be alive. They'll all be alive, almost certainly. Um, what was yours? <laughs> Go on. Okay, so I just have to repeat this into the mic so the people at home can hear it. Um, our audience member, do you mind saying your name? And you can feel free to change it. Uh, <laughs> what, what's, what's your name? Katie. Katie, another Katie. This, is, this, this show could be retitled What Katie Did. <laughs> or in this case, did not do, I think. Um, Katie said she left her vaginal bush go wild. And yes? Oh, because I knew... I was going swimming with a friend who felt self-conscious about her vaginal thrush. She didn't want to go swimming because she was like, no, my vaginal thrush. And you said, no, sisters unite. 
I'm going to let my bush run wild, more like a creeper up the side of a building, like Ivy, the pubic hair version of Ivy, to go out in solidarity with you. And did you swim like the glorious feminist you are? Yes, you did. Have you since then done any kind of um, trimming back of the ivy? You quite enjoy it, so you've stayed with it. Yes, you did it for feminism. Yes, come on. Come on. Come on. Um, anyone else got one? Yes? Oh, hold on. So I'm just going to repeat it. My, my six-year-old... Do I assume you're called Katie or have we departed? <laughs> I can take your real name. Uh, Lo. 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 So Lo said, my six-year-old was cast as the innkeeper's wife. Go on. I felt unhappy about that. Because let's be honest, the innkeeper's wife's doing the heavy lifting in the house. Yes. We should, uh, we should just get you a mic. This is quite long. Um, go on. <laughs> How to chat with the teacher? And they recast it. They recast it. And now it's two female innkeepers. Oh, so that's, now it's lesbian innkeepers. I love that. So you updated the nativity with lesbian innkeepers. <laughs> that is an act of feminism. Both... So mighty and so trivial at the same time. I think you've won guilty feminism forever. That is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. I actually love that. I love that. I would like to see an all-female and minority-gendered version of the nativity myself. I mean, I don't want to exclude the boys, but also, I mean, can they not have an alternative one that's called... We could, we could do a patriarchal one, which would just be called the nativity. Um, a woman is visited by an angel and told, you're knocked up. I didn't consent to that, Gabriel. Um, it's not a great story. Um, wait, 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 for one, just one more, yes. Oh, Jesus. Robin Blood. Jesus. You two should know each other. In the interval, I want you two to get to know each other as punning feminists. Uh, has anyone got anything they need actual help with? Has anyone got anything where you go, I have a feminist project, and it would be great if everyone in this room got behind it. Is anyone doing anything that they would like help with? Yes. Do you want to, as you're in the front row, why don't you just take the mic? What's your name? Sharon. Sharon. Big round of applause for Sharon. Just stand up. Okay. And then just turn around to the audience. Hi. <laughs> So I'm from Mexico, in case anyone's wondering why I sound like this. Um, I'm an actress, but I'm currently directing my own film. Yes. And it is a female revenge film. Ooh. <laughs> and it explores the morality of feminism. So there's these five very attractive women, diverse, in a house, and they basically, vigilante type, go and pick up guys to then kill them, and these are guys who have been <laughs> rapists, serial killers, murderers, but then the plot twist is one of the guys that they catch that they think they have evidence of, turns out that he may or may not be guilty of these things. So I'm currently working on the ending, either he's guilty and he leaves, or he's not guilty and he dies. So that is the idea. It's very stylish, very neon, very Edgar Wright sort of film. <laughs> and it's vintage, because I like vintage style. So that is something and that I would love all of you guys' opinion. And so do you need Kickstarter money? What are you looking for here? Honestly, it's in its first stages. I already am co-writing the script. I already have a pitch, but I mean, Kickstarter would be great, but if any production company is willing to fund it, I'm also open to that. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, quite honestly, get in line behind Bob and Blood, but okay. no, I like this. What's it called? It doesn't have a title yet. doesn't have a title. I was thinking to use red lipstick as a concept, mm -hmm. because when women tend to feel confident and go out at night, they wear red lipstick. And red lipstick has a lot of history of feminist movements with, you know, sexual assault and many other things. And during the war in the 40s, it was also quite important. 
because it was apparently anti-Hitler because Hitler hated makeup, so... I did not know that about Hitler, but it's... Fun fact. It's one more strike against him, in my opinion. I love a red <laughs> lipstick. Uh, what's your name? Sharon. Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. Like Sharon, like Sharon. 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 And Sharon, is there anywhere that uh, people can email you if they want to see the script or the treatment? Yes. Um, I mean, I have an Instagram Why, with my name. I do you... Well, tonight's theme is internet security, so I'm going to suggest <laughs> that if you would like to hear more from Sharon, email guiltyfeminist at gmail.com, which is our email, and we'll put you in touch with her, and then Sharon can be in touch with me rather than putting all of her details out online. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. <laughs> if, if you've got any thoughts for Sharon and she'd like to hear some feedback, she'll be around in the interval in the bar. Will you be around in the bar downstairs? And then, you know, come up and have a chat to her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody who contributed tonight. Are we ready to start the show? Woo! Then please welcome to the stage my incredible co-pilot for this evening. It's the wonderful Kima Bob. <laughs> Kima, Kima, Kima. Debra, Debra, Debra. It's so wonderful to see you. It's so nice to be seen, man. I know. Have you seen the weather? Yeah. It's super windy today. Yeah, it's, it's quite Londony. But do you know what? I'm chaotic. kind of relieved because we had such a long summer. You know when October 31st, you know on Halloween, yeah, where we yeah. didn't eat a cardigan, I was like, oh my God. we wrong, we've broken it. Yeah, I w- and I mean, I still feel that, but if it was as hot now, so I'm really enjoying the fact yeah. that it's raining and looking like London. It's, I'm, I'm like, thank God, thank God. It's giving like a, a November's worth of weather on one day. Yeah, that is the only thing. It's a yeah. bit wild. I was joking with a guest today backstage that um, the sky is doing an impression of my mental state. <laughs> that's fun just some dark humour yeah well does our mental state not in fact do an impression of the weather mm. is, I think there's science to demonstrate does art that. imitate life <laughs> does life imitate me I mean life certainly should imitate you Kima because you I think you are in some ways the temperature of the room that you're in you bring the you bring thanks the, man yeah you do bring a temperature into every room I don't I have no idea what that means but I love it <laughs> What it means is you don't know what rooms you're not in are like. Yes. Do you see what I mean? When y- you don't know what Kima Bob free rooms are like, they're very boring. <laughs> you don't want to be in them. You don't want to be in them. There are if some anyone people. Anyone who's sad at home and wants to invite me to stuff, I'll come. I'll, c- I'll change the temperature. We'll do what we have to yeah, do. Yeah, you come in with a spirit, with an energy, <laughs> with a glow. You Thank come you in. So much you're a room good. changer. Thank you for the positivity. Yeah. I'm all oh about the God. positivity. Do you know what? If the sky was still doing an impression in my mental state, people would be confused. They'd go outside. It'd be very sunny. Yay! What's going on? What's going on out here? I'm loving that. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities, which... Thank you very much. That's as close as I'm going to get to a Hey Jude moment. <laughs> I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Kima Bob, and we're talking about online safety. Um, now, the reason we're talking about online safety today is because we have an incredible guest who's written a book about it, and it's really, really fascinating. But firstly, I'm going to ask you, how do you feel about online safety, Kima? Any stories to share? Uh, like, I mean, how do I feel about online safety? Um, does it exist? <laughs> I think would be my first question. The internet is such a wild place. And um, I, I personally uh, have been on the like receiving end of uh, weird stuff. A lot of people uh, don't like my voice. And if you're one of those people, this moment in particular is probably tough for you. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. Um, I think your but, voice is incredible in every way, like metaphorically thanks, and literally. But the thing is, Deborah, the thing is, you're not the person sending me weird messages. No, that's true. <laughs> if it if came you out were. that I were, if it came out that we were, yeah. that would be a twist. Uh, yeah. If it was, if you were like, what? We traced the IP Deborah. address. Yeah. <laughs> that would be terrible. That would be so dark. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, I got, like, this email of a person who was like... Um, if you are what the future of my country sounds like, then I'm glad I have this terminal illness that I have. Oh, my God. So I won't be alive. Oh. 
to see my country turn into a bunch of lefty socialists, communists. It was just a whole bunch of list of the words. Oh you know the God. words. Yeah. Wow. It was, I was like... That's strong words. But do you know what? You're so left-wing, I'd rather be dead. Like, that's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot to hear. But if I gave that one person mm. something to be grateful for... At a time of need. Yeah. I, do you know what I had recently that I've never had before? Because some of my friends get a lot of unsolicited dick pics in their DMs and mm. a lot of, ex, like, quite explicit content. Yeah. And sometimes, this is, this is such an I'm a feminist, but I'm so, I'm always so grateful I don't get it. I don't want it. Please don't send it to me. Uh, but there are moments where I go, I wonder why I don't get it. Do they yeah, not? Yeah, you know, same. It's not, uh, you know, do you yeah, just, uh, if, if you're, if you're listening one? out there, uh, dick pics and there's, It'd be safe, but I am feeling left out. Yeah, I'm not, and I'm not, and, I'm, and it's an awful, that awful thing where you go, of course, obviously I'm not, but <laughs> No, recently, it's me, I'm feeling left out. Well, recently, recently, and please don't send dick pics, don't send dick pics to me or Kima, please, please, please don't. I don't know, maybe me. No, I don't, <laughs> no, definitely don't send them to either, I don't want that, but in the lockdown, I, uh, and I didn't see it because a lot of messages go into your, um, other like it's a, it's another yeah. box and I I hardly ever remember to look there so I look like once a year or so the ultimate request Ooh. yeah it's like it's like secret requests or something like that. I don't know and <laughs> and sometimes I'll see something from ages ago in there and go oh my god I never got back to this person and sometimes you know I don't have time to get back to absolutely everyone and I really feel bad about that but I really my bandwidth is not that Guilt every day Guilt oh, every oh day. swim in it let it consume you but sometimes I think oh god I didn't see this you know and I write back to someone or whatever but this guy in the pandemic had written me a thing that said, and I've never had anything like this before, Kima. And I'm not. I, it, this is. I, I'm just going to tell it to you and make. Tell me. Own, uh... I'm going to tell you and make your own decision. This is what he wrote. He said, "I'm alone in the pandemic, and I listen to your podcast all the time, and I'm a big fan. And I just wanted to send you all of these pictures of my penis." <laughs> And me in women's underwear. And he said, all I want is for you to tell me how small my penis is. And to like, he wanted to be humiliated. And I don't think oh. a small penis, by the way, is anything to humiliate oh. anyone about. I think penises come in all sizes. And some of them are good for some things and some of them are good for others. Oh. That, that's genuinely true. Like, I genuinely do mean that. I'm not being like, oh, but all penises are great penises. I genuinely do think. It depends what you're doing with it. Because there are some moves yeah. that are very exciting yeah, with a small penis but well, you would never attempt with a large one mm. it would be no I wouldn't anyway reckless endangerment right and there are some <laughs> there are some things for which I would prefer a larger penis but that's it depends on the day it's a variety yeah, yeah now what this guy said was for him obviously he lives in a patriarchal system he's been taught he was like I don't want to love this Christmas. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. And he's in a patriarchal system, and it's a kink. He wants a woman to tell him that his penis is small. I and shouldn't have asked you. I feel it was a strange move, because he's, he's a big fan of the show, so it seems unusual. But anyway, he sent me all of these pictures, some of him in uh, lingerie, some of him in just with just his penis out, you know. And he said, all I want you to do is laugh about my penis with your friends. Deborah, you're doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> you've, done, you've done the thing. Well, we can't undo this. The la it's being recorded. The laughter is presumably happening. Presumably he's listening. Oh, uh, no. But, but, but... That's not why we make this podcast. But... We do not make it to arouse that man. No, not, not exclusively, certainly. <laughs> It's not my top five reasons, but I mean, look, every, everyone's got to get by, but it's more, here's the twist, here's the twist, you guys, his penis was huge. So if he's listening now, he was enjoying it up until then and going, oh my God, oh my God, it's finally happening. Yeah. And now he's very disappointed yeah, how about because that? it was objectively large, like objectively large. I mean, it wasn't untenable, but it was, it wasn't like frightening but it was a large penis in my experience in my very limited experience Kima because you know I've not my experience is not maximal but, the, but I was trying to sip water <laughs> his penis was large and I was like what 
In what world do you think you've got a small penis? What, what size do you think they got up to? He's been watching too much porn. Mm, sad. Yeah. Sad for him. Uh, but I didn't, I just didn't respond. I didn't, I didn't, rep- I didn't report it. I didn't know what to do because I was like, it was a very, oh, weirdly, yeah, where go? weirdly, given the nature of what he was sending me, it was a res- very respectful message. Like, it was like, <laughs> I really love your show. Obviously, you know, he's a fan. And it was like, nothing like, I'm trying to intimidate you. It was like, thank you so much for everything you do. By the way. I'm alone in lockdown and this is my dream. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. Like, obviously he shouldn't do like, that. I know how much you respect dreams from people of all genders. <laughs> That's the thing is, I just didn't know what to do. And I just, so I just left it. And I probably should have said, please, look, thank you for your kind words on the show. I don't know. Don't, I would please check in with anybody before sending genitalia exposed in the post. Mm. Like, isn't that, that's Mm. just basic. I just want to commend you on your uh, communication skills there. See, what you did was you didn't skip over the pleasant part of the message, right? You you replied to every part of the message. Every beat. Something that a lot of young men can learn from um, (laughs) in romantic situations. Yes, because they just hear the The bit bit that they want. Yeah, Yeah. and then they just come in with something basic and horny. Yeah, but you weren't just like, creepy. You were like... (laughs) Hey, yeah. I don't know, Deborah. I'm not the I'm not the expert on the right way to reply to like, yeah, w- weird, scary, creepiness. Even if the energy is like, hey, and they're like, hey. Yeah. I I mean, it it really floored me. I just didn't. I I mean, I should have probably written back, and I I'm. And, but also, then there's this big weight of responsibility on me well, that is to the- be writing back to a six month old chain of. Well, what, Coaches of someone else's penis. Is that my right job? Thing is that my also, job? I, I think what you're doing here is you're, you're um, doing intention over uh, dick pics, right? And you're like, you're like, it seemed like the intention was not malicious. Yes, it wasn't. But However, the dick pics do imply a bit of malice. <laughs> yeah, it was more... He, he was getting off on popping them in my inbox, yeah. so to speak. And but, so, do we respond or do we report? Do you know uh, what I mean? I didn't report it, but I just left it because it, it's a lot. It's exhausting, isn't it, to have to compose an email back or a well? You didn't DM. send the message. No, you've received the message, and the onus is on you. Like you need yes. more things to do. <laughs> I didn't need another to do list. So, <laughs> that was, so we've both told a story about something recent. <laughs> um, our guest is going to be a lot more. Brilliant and insightful than that. But this is a comedy podcast, so we've banged it down on the table, so to speak. I want to say, let's take a moment, because like, I don't think that either one of us knows how to actually handle this situation appropriately. It's and so I, clear that we don't, and we and need I, help. And I think it's just really important to note, like, you know, like... People don't know what to fucking do in these streets, man. It's the Wild West. <laughs> it's the Wild West. There's no rules. There's no governance. There's just Elon Musk on a stallion <laughs> with a, a pair of gardening shears riding towards you laughing maniacally. And that's a lot. <laughs> Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah with a few announcements. Thanks to everyone who came to Campus Christmas. What a wonderful show for an incredible cause. It's not too late to donate to the Say It Loud Club if you couldn't come. One more show before Christmas, King's Place, two episodes on Wednesday, the 14th of December. Back with a bang in the new year with four shows at Soho Theatre. On Wednesday, the 4th of January, we're having a very special town hall where we try and solve a problem together and you can come up and take the mic. On Thursday, the 5th of January, we're having a special, uh, Shapi Kosandi and I are co-hosting a special about the terrible situation in Iran. And on Friday, the 6th of January and Saturday, the 7th of January, guests to be announced. Thursday, the 26th of January, we are back at King's Place. Sunday, 29th of January, we're at the Rose Theatre in Kingston. For more details and to book, go to guiltyfeminist.com. Join our Patreon to support the show and get ad-free episodes and more besides. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you don't mind. And now, back to the show. 
I am so excited to bring on our guest. I read her book and thought it was absolutely incredible and not just incredible. I felt like often we'll have like a culture episode or something and I'll say, this is a book you'll enjoy. But I feel this book is a set text. It's absolutely mandatory reading for any feminist. And I don't normally say that. You know I don't do it. I don't exaggerate. She doesn't try to make us read at all. I don't. I don't. I barely, I barely ever tell you you have to read, but I really think we should all read it. Um, the opening, the introduction is incredible. Uh, it's about uh, how the author uh, was a very young political figure. She basically you know, ran for office for you know, the council and got on, and she was the youngest person who'd ever done that in that constituency. Um, and was immediately uh, the, the subject of a vicious online attack um, for, you know, a racist attack, a misogynist attack. Um, and so she didn't just go, oh, well, how do I protect myself? She's done something absolutely incredible, and she's founded something called Glitch, which is a UK charity campaigning to make digital spaces safe for all by ending online abuse. That's somebody who really cares about her community. Her book, How to Stay Safe Online, is the first powerful, comprehensive guide for digital self-care and allyship. You are going to learn so much tonight, and you must all buy the book. Get it on Kindle tonight, or buy it ideally from someone who pays their tax and have it sent to your home. Um, but right now, you're going to meet the woman herself. Please put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Shayi Akiwowo. <laughs> Oh, she, I just can't believe how good your book is because I think there's a lot of books written now that actually, and this is an awful thing to say, but some books now aren't very good. It's sort of like <laughs> sometimes I get a book and I think someone's got a lot of Instagram followers and then they get a book deal, but I'm not really learning a lot. It's fine, but I'm not really learning a lot new, whereas I think you've created new ways of thinking about this because we are, as Kima says, in the Wild West. This is a new territory. Like, nobody's had the thought to make these uh, extraordinary uh, frameworks for thinking about it, and now you have. So, uh, firstly, thank you for coming on the show. And secondly, could you tell us a little bit about Glitch? Thank you so much for having me. Four degrees outside, it's cold, and so I really appreciate... Um, you having me on. It's the first time meeting Debbie in person. We've been on Instagram. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, Glitch is going to be five uh, next, sorry, six next April. And it's a charity that's all about making the online space safe. And we really mean that systemically. We mean government playing their part, tech playing their part, schools playing their part, and empowering individuals to feel safe. It started with me, my little smart car, going around to schools, um, pre-pandemic, um, talking to boys about how they can be allies to women online. Because mm. from the very beginning, I believe that it wasn't about telling women what else they should be doing to stay safe. Mm. We already have a to-do list when we leave to go to the clubs. We already have a to-do list when we go to school or go to um, the corner shop. We have a to-do list of stuff that we have to go through to make sure we're staying safe. We don't need another thing when it comes to the online space. So it started off with making sure we understood the ecosystem that supported women to stay safe online. And there's a reason why I focus on women because women are 27 times more likely to be abused online. Every 30 seconds, a woman is abused on Twitter. Black women are 84% more likely to be abused online than white women. Like, there's, there's a reason why I'm unapologetic about focusing on women and gender. Wow. Mm. Uh, my goodness. Like, so a lot of people, like, and sometimes those people are well-meaning, they'll be like, okay, if... Uh, being online is getting you this kind of heat, is getting you this kind of stuff. Why don't you just go offline? Like, f first of all, wh where are we supposed to go? But can you, <laughs> can you explain kind of like why that doesn't work? I talk a lot about victim blaming in the book because I think in our narrative, in our everyday language, we've, uh, we've become too tolerant to online abuse. We keep saying, oh, maybe you shouldn't have said that or maybe you make your pri account private or what do you expect when you pose like that? We've given... 
the same victim blaming language that we addressed offline when we said it's not a woman's fault for how she dresses, how much she drinks, what she wears. We've now said, okay, we're not going to do that offline, but we now blame women online. And um, my response to that is, and I've talked about this in, the, in my TED talk, and I've talked about this in the book, really checking your language to say, actually, what can I do to help you feel safer online? How can I amplify your voice, voices? I think the way Guilty um, Feminist podcast on Instagram really amplifies wider feminist issues. You go from talking about Iran, talking, to, uh, talking about what's happening in Qatar, you know, that is how you amplify voices. You don't say, oh, actually, you know, Iranian women don't think you should be on Instagram right now because you're going to get shadow banned. Like, it's just, it's, it's unimaginable. Can I just give credit to Zainab, who mm -hmm. is our Instagram, brilliant Instagram person, and uh, she is a woman of colour, and I think that the, uh, the, the change I've seen in our Instagram, having her on there has been incredible, and I'm lucky enough to be able to hire someone like Zainab. So I just wanted to shout out, because you were giving us a, a, a compliment, and I was sitting here feeling like, I don't do a lot of that. I do. I, some of it's me, but I just don't, the responsibility of having to keep it active all day, every Absolutely. day. Again, I just find it exhausting and terrifying, and people, you know, come for you a lot. Like, a lot. if you're, you know, even people on my side of the divide who'll be like, why haven't you said anything about Ukraine today? And I'm like, because I've literally been working with some refugees, actually, and I haven't been online. And I'm like, I just don't think... Or because I'm brushing my teeth and I haven't seen the news yet. You know, this, 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 yeah. this urgency. I talk about this in the book as well, where there was a lot of um, people being... A lot of in Instagram influencers who'd done a lot to learn about how to use their platforms during Black Lives Matter in 2020. And there were other things happening with Israel and Palestine. And a lot of them were being attacked for not talking quick enough. I was like, that's about 50 years of like foreign politics and yeah, conflict yeah. that you wanted someone to learn in like 20 hours. Yeah. Like and someone from Love Island as well who may... <laughs> Not have engaged before. They shouldn't, but you shouldn't. I do, I find it I I find it difficult, and I really try and stay across these things. And I and I'm just like, it, it, the uh, the implication that everyone has to have an opinion on everything yeah. and be an educator on everything. And I'm like. Not to, and also not to disparage people from Love Island. Yeah. I'm not saying some, if you're on Love Island, you're not educated. But I'm it's saying like, go on Love Island, have a great time, have a great time. But you may or may not then have an opinion on everything. Absolutely. And the the implication that we've all got to and silence is violence. I think is really dangerous. Yeah. And we only do that to women. Mm. We only make <laughs> <laughs> we only put the litmus test that you must be across everything and have this the clear brief mm -hmm. in order for you to be online. Who says so? You don't do that to Trump. He hasn't got a clear brief, and you put him back on Twitter. Yeah. So I, I, again, I think it's the uh, boys get to hit the notes app. And take the, I, it, it was a misunderstanding, thumbs out for a spin. Whereas we have to be so considered. And I talk about the importance of intent, being intentional on the platform and that it is easy to get sucked up in the algorithms of, of, of platforms and, you know, your head spinning and actually, like, actually, what's the relationship I want with tech? I think that is really important. But I do think there is a higher standard that society places on women when they're online because we do it offline. And people from, um, in my mind, I was just thinking from um, other marginalized genders, because I think oftentimes when you come from a certain community, people expect you to be like the spokesperson um, and to be a good representative, whatever the fuck that means as well. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I just think, I, I just, would someone said, a couple of people said you haven't put up a Ukrainian flag yet. And I was like, but is Putin really... Is he just your ground? Is he going to stop bombing Ukraine because Deborah Francis White has put up a Ukrainian flag? Oh well, I'll pull back now. And I'm like, unless it's practical, unless it's, I'm like, I, what I really want oh my people God, does to he do. Does he have a crush on you? <laughs> is that really? you the lingerie day? Really? Oh my God! Can you imagine if those lot. pics were Putin? That's that's, <laughs> oh. that's a high standard of allyship no, right there. Right. But, so, uh, can but, you ask? Yeah, go on. I want to say like, mm. the, so the the answer to a conundrum from the top of the show of Deborah getting all this stuff from the studio and not really knowing how to respond to it is the answer um, that you just, just shouldn't have sent them. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, because she's like, should I respond? I'm like, respond block? And this is the thing, like, it shouldn't be on her. I just didn't know what to do. And I just, I just pulled back and just went, ah, oh, I'm going to look away from it. But is it okay sometimes as a woman online to not have a response to everything and just to look away? Or do we always have a responsibility if somebody sends us something 
and we think they will listen to us to say something. Do you think? Can I give nuance to this? Oh, I'd love you to give a little bit of nuance. So I think on the on one hand, we are a boundaryless society. Mm-hmm. We don't respect boundaries. We, we, we still are not grappling with consent. Consent is not just about sex. It's about any interaction with somebody. We have that issue. We have, a, we have an issue with that. And I think that plays out even more so online where you think you have a right to tell a woman that you don't know across the world that they should have an opinion on something. Like the entitlement to that is it smells of patriarchy. On the, on the other hand, and I talk about this in a chapter in the book about allyship, there is a need for people to be self-aware of the privilege that they do hold online, that where they can extend their platforms. And that does not mean you do that at the expense of centering yourself. I think it's important for us to do things from a place of, in, of trauma-informed, being trauma-informed. I talk about that in the book. And I also I think about from, from a regulated nervous system. No one wants a panic shade trying to respond to the news and the way that our economy is going and our, you know, the, the way that the political landscape is going. No one wants an unregulated nervous system um, shade akiwowo. No one wants that. No one needs that. My boyfriend definitely doesn't want that, right? Okay. So I, 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 I think it's about making sure that when we have got... Um, we all got privilege. We've all got relative privilege. Really doing that from a place of well-being and wellness mm-hmm. because that's where you're less likely to make mistakes. That's why you've got people always apologizing for stuff because they're doing things so rash. It rashly, is that a word? Mm-hmm. It is now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, urgency. urgency. Urgency is an issue. It's a disease. It's a massively a disease and it erodes our boundaries. It erodes our, uh, our critical thinking, our engagement with stuff. And it erodes actually authenticity. I don't want you to do a black square because you feel guilty. I want you to stand for my liberation in truth and in power, not just the black square. And, 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 <laughs> and to not make assumptions or projections based on whether someone does or does not put a black square up. Yeah. I think the constant assumptions and projections are exhausting online. What you talk about in the book is how we can hold tech giants accountable. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, the biggest guilty feminist act I've probably done in the last 10 years is be on Twitter. Uh Um, And it's staring me right in the face now with it being bought by Elon Musk. Mm. And it's not just Twitter. We're seeing layoffs in Facebook and I've got real, real concerns of where they are going to be firing people. And I do think it's going to be in the trust and safety teams where we've just finally had people sent to gender, sent to women's safety, and they're going to now be in the firing line. And I think... um, Tech has done a really good PR job in us thinking that we've got no say in how the platforms can do any better. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case. We've got consumer power. Like, we've been able to push um, supermarkets, businesses. um, After the 2008 financial crash, we pushed the finance uh, sector. It could be better. But we push industries to do more as consumers every single day. You see unions doing that with the strikes. As annoying and as inconvenient the strikes are, solidarity. You see that there's power in union and in consumer power, and we give that away every time that we don't listen to or read um, up with what tech companies are doing, how they are buying our our data and how they're they're using it against us. And tech companies have been able to make billions of pounds of profit on the back of our safety. And the, the book is about how can we start interrogating this issue like we have with climate change how can we start understanding what small acts that we can start um taking and i think that's blocking and reporting and um making sure that the data is capturing the a level of harm that's on the platform if we ignore it like crime offline I, this is where i bring in my local council days if we don't report crime even though that we know the police could be a lot better we don't have data and stats therefore to be putting resources in if we don't report stuff on the platform tech companies going to be like well there's not really an issue with with, with okay this is a sigh of the person that goes, I report it, where is it going? But I totally hear what you're saying. Mm. If you stop reporting it, then it's really going nowhere. So I do need to write back to that man. <laughs> I don't know if you need to write back to him or if you need to report him. Oh, I know, oh. but I think I need to write back and say, you. I think he would listen. And I think I need to say... You, Are you you're now in a place where you feel like you can without feeling harm? I think I have to because of what you've just said. And I think if anyone else does anything like this, I need to report it. I think I do because what you've just said really makes a lot of sense. And I think um, holding – we have to not just go, well, what can we do? We have to hold tech giants accountable. How are you feeling about, like, Elon Musk and oh the, the, the wild way that he is mani- – 
managing loosely Twitter, do you think Twitter's not long for this world? Or do you think... I mean, who can afford to buy it for 44 billion? Not me. Um, <laughs> we could do a whip round tonight. <laughs> um, I'm devastated, actually. I'm going to be completely honest. My morale is low. Mm. Um, it feels like we've gone backwards in so many ways. Mm. The, we finally was able to get a hateful conduct policy on the platform just before I went on sabbatical in spring that took into account intersectionality. I know we got them to understand that women can be one more than one thing at the same time. And I just worry that that means that all of that is going to wipe away. And you did that through Glitch? We did that through Glitch. Um, I sit on... The t- t- uh, well, I don't know if I do anymore. We'll find out. I sit on Twitter's Trust and Safety Council on their gender harassment subcommittee and we've done a lot of work and twitter actually isn't the worst platform out there anymore because they've have ta- they have listened and they yeah. have taken to and taken you're to- worried that's going to be rolled back i'm worried that's going to be rolled back and i'm worried that other platforms are now going to be like well if they don't have to do that why should we and we're going to see this race to the bottom whereas you know six months ago Everyone was trying to compete to be that safer space for people. We were seeing tech companies now centering safety. Like Bumble's whole MO is about centering women's safety. If a woman on Bumble um, faces some kind of harassment or abuse through someone that they've dated on the app, you can get paid therapy through Bumble. Like it's an amazing support system wow. that they provide for their users. So we were really seeing this like this this rush to safety. And now I just really 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 concerned we've got a lot of elections coming up Mm -hmm. and we know how powerful twitter can be in bringing down democracies and people and misinformation i am really really concerned but i do believe that we have consumer power in saying okay this is what we expect from platforms moving forward this is the standard at which you know how we have like our ideal partner Mm. you know back in the day it was like Bow Wow and Romeo I've matured since then (laughs) but I think we should be saying that as consumers like what's my ideal tech platform we do that with supermarkets we're given choice Mm. right we're Mm. given choice when it comes to banks sorry banks how can we give ourselves more choice when it comes to uh, social media platforms and engaging and then saying what's the minimum criteria so that I'm not giving my my data away for someone to use that to exploit another woman in another country, the other side of the world. That brings me to a question I've been dying to ask you. What does a feminist internet look like? Oh, I think there are need, there needs to be some key principles to a feminist internet. I think first it's transparency, and we don't have that. Does anyone here know how algorithms work on platforms? Like no idea. We have a vague idea that some people can be shadow banned on Instagram. We don't really know where things go once you report it. I think we need transparency. We need radical transparency. Second thing, um, or second feminist internet principle would be um, a power balance. At the moment, we have very, very rich people making decisions about what is essentially a public platform, right? I think, what would it look like for us to have representatives proper representatives that, can, that can, can speak on behalf of communities or advocate for communities or be a facilitator for those communities to be heard? How can they be part of po- platform policy? How can they be part of safety by design? How can they be part of auditing these platforms? Because that also doesn't happen. They seem to be one of very few businesses that can run for years and years and no one audits them. Mm. Who here has to do their tax accounts every year? Mm. I have just submitted mine today. Yay, like, congratulations. <laughs> thanks. Like, they're the only ones that seem to get away with it. And then I think the third thing would be joy. Mm. I, I wrote this at the la- one of the last um, paragraphs in the book. Like, I really hope that in five years' time when we're having a conversation again, and if you invite me again, we're talking about how we can have joy online how we can find love again online, how we can, we can learn a language, we can meet people, communities. You know, what we were seeing in the early parts of lockdown in 2020 where people were, like, doing... How many uh, Zoom quizzes were people a part of? Like, mm-hmm. that, that mm-hmm. joy, mm-hmm. radical joy, people finding themselves an expression rather than the far-right co-opting freedom of expression to mean a very, very, very narrow thing. And then a lot of us, particularly women, don't get to be in full liberation and full expression of who they are. Mm, Wonderful. Thank you. And on the spot as well. Um, You're genuinely incredible. Does anyone in the audience have a question for Shayi? 
It doesn't have to be a good question. Like, don't, like I only say that because I think people get anxious that it's going to be so good. Go yes. On. Hi. Hi, Shay. Um, I'm really interested in the combination of your political experience and now what you're doing around tech and online safety. Um, I don't know if you're still in politics, uh, but I'm interested in what you think about the, the role of um, abuse that women politicians get. Uh, do you think that's a barrier to democracy and what could be done about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the first workshops um, that I did outside going into schools was about supporting women into politics. Um, I actually worked with a specific political party that had just set up... Um, <laughs> I can say it, Women's Equality Party, um, to help their new candidates that were standing think about online safety. So I went through a kind of couple of hours training and then from there was able to develop a workshop for women in politics. And as long as I'm breathing and the CEO and founder of Glitch, there will always be a free workshop for women in politics um, for them to feel safe. And by politics, I don't just mean people who... Um, I don't know if, if it's brave or silly standing for politics, I'm calling myself a recovering politician, but it's also for campaigners, people who um, are, have got um, online communities. I really mean politics in the widest sense, not what media has narrowed us to think that politics is just two political parties of a particular tribe. Um, so yeah, please do check out Glitch's um, website. We have free workshops for women in politics um, all the time because it is a massive barrier. It's, it causes fear for women to want to stand. We, no one wants to be ridiculed and that's what we fear happening all the time. And it's also a massive distraction. Lots and lots of research shows that um, women who are in the public eye and have faced abuse are less likely than a man to um, win their seat. So it actually impacts democracy. They're then we're having this pipeline of women wanting to stand being cut and then it impacts their kids and it impacts their family like it has this massive ripple effect that I talk about in the book financially um, on, on their career on their on their mental health and well-being and, and, and physically like we're talking about women, we're talking about uh, violence against women in politics I can't end my response to you without acknowledging Joe Cox right MP mm. That person who, who murdered her was radicalised online. That's another thing that I'm really concerned about. Whereas we see the economy get worse, we're going to see cybercrime increase and we're going to see hate crime increase and we're going to see grooming increase. And so, yeah, I, I really do think um, violence against women in politics does not get discussed enough in this country. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else uh, got anything for Shay? Yes, there's a hand there. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned a bit about uh, visiting the schools and your work with boys. I just would love to know, how did you find the response from the boys you were working with? Um, it was easier when they were younger. I remember starting the, uh, at the school on a Monday with the year sevens. And by Thursday night, I was dreading the year elevens. And not because boys smell... Um, <laughs> but just already that toxic masculinity had set in, that hardening of their hearts. Boys saying, well, I was bullied, so I'm going to do it to them. Like, the penetration, like, Ray, that needed was not was beyond what I could do in, an, in a 25-minute assembly, and it broke my heart. Mm. Um, so I do think that if there are um, teachers or, or parents here really trying to get um, your schools particularly in year six, year five and year six, to really be thinking about online safety before they go to big school. I heard that from someone else recently. They said that the older boys were jeering the woman who'd come in to talk and shouting misogynistic stuff, but the younger boys were open, interested, lovely. And they said, we just got to get in younger and younger and younger and younger and keep on coming in. It's no good doing one thing when they're 10 and then leaving them to the throwing them to the internet for seven years, then coming back when they're 17 and expecting that that one workshop will have stayed with them. As amazing as I am, no, it's not going to stay with them. <laughs> and, and, and what happened... I talk about a public health approach uh, in the book. After George Floyd's murder in 2020, I was really reflective around how I make sure that I don't set up an organisation that is supporting a pipeline to prison. Mm. That all the kind of policies that we were campaigning for wasn't just about everyone needs to go to jail. How do you have like restorative community justice? How, how, what does that look like? And I think schools can play a really exciting role in that. 
So what happened to those year 10 and year 11s um, in, in this boys' school? What did they go through and how are they having that trauma de dealt with so that they're not having their hearts hardened, but they're really allowed to heal from that? And that can sound like, you know, a bit whatever, too much for a school. And I don't think it's the role for teachers. I think it is the role for, of non-formal education providers to come in. But I do look at a hardened boy in year 10. Mm. What are you? You're 14, 15. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, a system that's failed you. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you add race to that, right? Black men feel like they have to be much harder than that. Who has allowed them to be soft? Who's allowed them to communicate and share their feelings, share their hurt, allowed to cry? Like all of this is caught up in patriarchy. That is, that is uh, an oppressor to boys as well. I really agree. And I feel like we are too fast now within the school system to say exclude and he's an abuser and I'm like, well, hold on a minute. If we're not allowed to learn as children, if we're not allowed to screw up as children, it's not coming from nowhere. I also don't want a situation where young girls are having to share a space with someone who has harassed or abused them. But I also just don't want to throw children to the curb and just go, oh, well, you fucked up now. You know, you were abused and now you abuse someone else. So your life is over like this idea that we, as you say, uh, if we're going to be abolitionists, then we absolutely have to also say we must have some kind of restorative justice in our schools. We've got to allow people to make mistakes. And that doesn't, and holding people accountable is key. Mm -hmm. But I think what we've seen on the platform is that we want blood. We want vigilantes. And I talk about how even people who are doing allyship online can actually become perpetrators. Um, there's a story about, um, I, in, I get to interview Jamila Jamil in the mm. book, and she talks about being a mental health advocate and a trigger warning, I'm going to mention the word suicide. She talks about ba battling with suicide ideation. And she's very public about this on her platform. And I think she screwed up on something and on, online and she was held accountable for it. But mental health advocates in Twitter bios were telling her to kill herself. So what so happens shocking. on the platform that you forget yourself, you know, you forget your values, your intentions, you get caught up in something. And I think a public health approach to social media, to online abuse would be a really interesting thing because I think it pulls all the best of us, but also the worst of us. Absolutely agreed. Does anyone have one more quick question? We've really got to finish, but I don't want anyone to go away without. Yes, just right there. Um, hi, I was just... The thing that I'm really interested in is that public health approach. So I'm a social media manager for a public mental health charity to look after a big mental health online community. And the important part for me was ethics before engagement. So thinking about our boundaries, where do we step in and where don't we? How do we escalate? Um, where is the GDPR boundaries? Where can we escalate? I'm working with the, the big social media um, functions to discuss online safety as well and on online harms but similar to you I had that um heart in the stomach moment I guess when Elon Musk took over Twitter because that's that feeling of is it all going to go and a big part for us is reminding people that they have agency so you have agency when you're interacting on social media you have agency to think about the algorithms to take a moment how's your body feel when you see stuff you know all of that kind of thing but how can we continue this with what is going on with twitter and what can we do as individuals to help so what can we do with our communities how can we help you in the amazing work you're doing what can we do Thank you so much. And Great thank you question. for the work that you do, because um, this time of year as well, like it does take a toll on mental health because it was a struggle to get out of bed this morning. Um, firstly, Glitch is doing a big give campaign. It's where we can get corporates and big big money banks people to do match funding and we want to have dedicated uh, workshops and training for LGBT plus communities next year so if anyone's able and willing I know times are tough and hard but if you're able to even donate a pound like it all adds up to help sponsor free workshops next year for LGBT plus communities that would be amazing Secondly, um, I think you're absolutely right that we always have to just come back to agency and boundaries, agency and, that, and, and community power. So the first thing we can all do is go away and have a conversation about online safety. You know how 
we're, we've, we've learned over the years, thanks to soaps like EastEnders and Coronation Street, to talk about mental health, to make, like, make it part of everyday conversation, to talk about domestic violence, because we know one in two women um, are facing some form of domestic violence. We need to make online abuse that thing, because so many of us, too many of us, tolerate abuse online. So I think um, one of the first things that I did when I, one of the first work resources I created, because I realised I can't get to all the schools um, in Newham, let alone in, in London, um, um, was create a resource on uh, how you could hold a conversation around online abuse. That is free to download on the Glitches website and will always be. And there's one specifically for black women as well, because that is important. If you can just have these conversations, I honestly believe that ideas will generate from those conversations because people are like, oh, I can talk about this now. I don't have to suffer in silence. It is the thing that we are all suffering with, whether that's directly or indirectly or fear of. It is a thing that is is stifling for all of us. And then uh, finally, with um, Elon Musk himself, I do try and say, like, what's happened on Twitter is not new. Like, we have been seeing this on other platforms. Like, Facebook are going to fire 11,000 people in comparison to Twitter which was like a thousand people like it is it is we have to not just focus on Elon Musk and the the, the media is really good at sensationalizing like they don't really like him already right so like it's easy just to add more like uh, fuel to the fire we have to make sure we're having a kind of a uh, broad approach to the issues on Facebook Twitter and Instagram and even Spotify are having conversations about recruitment and what's going to happen with safety and we know that's dangerous because when you give a man a mic these days on on Spotify they are talking a lot of bs um, um, you put my music data into the wrong hands. Oh, they'll know. They'll know everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so really be intentional about your platform. Like mute blocking and filtering does really send a signal that this person isn't worth amplifying. When people are talking about Trump, retweeting him, even screenshotting, they are driving traffic to his page. And it's not just Trump, it's Andrew Tate as well, who in 24 hours of being allowed back on Twitter had one million followers. That's one million, that's many boys many young men who are being groomed by him that are following him. We have to make these people unpopular. We do that by feeding the algorithms of more, of more sausage dog content and babies um, who are like pooing themselves, basically. That's, I'm arguing this in my book. I'm writing a book called Six Conversations We're Scared to Have. And one thing I'm arguing is some comedians now are doing jokes about trans people that are very, in my opinion, structurally violent and are impacting laws that are made about trans people. What I would say is, rather than elevating, or even to disagree with, and I'm not saying nobody should disagree with them, but if all day long the algorithm is saying, this is a very popular point of view, uh, and everyone then is driven to go and watch the special, what we're doing is we're creating a fiscal environment in which those kinds of statements or jokes are making somebody money. So what I would say is, can you amplify a trans comedian? Can you find a trans comedian? Can we all say, okay, today this has been said. People have already pointed out that this is an awful joke. What I'm going to do is instead of paying into that and making that fiscally beneficial for somebody, I am going to say, oh, have you seen Jordan's new show? and start retweeting trans comedians and start retweeting trans activists and think about it in the same way as donating. Absolutely. Absolutely. I talk about some steps you can take as digital citizens and being allies online, and it is spotting abuse, it's reporting it, but it's also amplifying the communities that are underrepresented because the key word you used, Deborah, was popular. Mm. The algorithms don't know the difference between bad popular and good popular. It's the old saying. They don't care. Any, any, uh, well, any engagement's good engagement. Mm. You know, any, any bad news is good news. It's the same, it's the same construct. So we have to teach the algorithms that actually you want to see more joy online, that you will get me on Instagram one hour later than I should be after I'm a celebrity because I'm looking at sausage dogs. Mm. That, that, that brings me joy. I don't need to be... Um, and I think it also amplifying means that we're not also feeling the scaremongering that happens a lot on the platform. That's another popular tactic that algorithms feed off. I don't know if you saw that clip of Bo Burnham saying that we, he means white people, I think, have colonised the world and there's no more land to colonise. What we're colonising now is attention. 
and your attention is valuable. So what will get clicks, which they can sell the clicks to advertisers, whether or not you even buy those products, your engagement, your attention is valuable. And you've only got so many, everyone, doesn't matter how rich you are, doesn't matter how glamorous you are, doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. We have the same hours in a day as Beyonce. (laughs) (laughs) We've only got 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And how many of those hours you're looking at, clicking on, looking at, clicking on, and going, well, I just want to see what he said now. Um, it's cu- I'm curious. I want to know. I want to know what Elon Musk said. I'll just go over and look at his. And, it, you know, we're playing their game. It has been a great honour mm. uh, to have such an incredible guest tonight. Please give a big round of applause yeah. for Shayi Akiwowo. <laughs> you have been listening to The Guilty Fabulous with me, Deborah Brussels my guest co-host, King Bob, and our very special guest, Shayi Akiwowo. The recording engine was Chris Sharp. The Guilty Fabulous theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Sadensky for the spontaneous job. Thanks to Zoe, Sally and everyone at King's Place as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfabulous.com. I really want to get a guest on, so before we do that, let's play I'm a Feminist Butt. <laughs> Um, I'm sure whoever's editing will not appreciate me going, ah! <laughs> or whoever has to hear it at home. It's Tom Selinsky. Well, I'm probably going to get some more emails about that. Wah. He will love it. He's never emailed you about <laughs> that. Wah. He loves it. No, um, no emails from my, my sexy haters. <laughs> Who'd rather be dead? You so, oh my God. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.